Test, test. Test, 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 test. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our third general meeting. I'm so glad everybody's here. I know this part of the semester can be really hectic, so I'm glad that everyone took the time out of the day to come here. Um, a couple of announcements before we get started. I wanted to let everyone know that October 8th, this Friday by 1159, if you're interested in joining the research project that's being headed up by Natalie and Justin on our executive board, um, the applications for that are due this Friday, October 8th at 1159 p.m. So um, if you're interested, they'll be up at the front at the end of the meeting. You can come and talk to them about it and they can ask any of any, they can answer any questions that you have, but it's a really great way to break into research as an undergrad. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell everyone is that tomorrow from 6 to 7 p.m. we'll be having a pharmacy workshop, um, and that's going to be co-hosted with AED. It's a really great and informational workshop, um, and it's important to be well-rounded pre-health students, so this is a really great opportunity to do just that. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and switch over to our PowerPoint. Hey BMSA, my name is Megan Giles and I'm the media chair. Welcome back to another episode of BMSA by UT Rounds. Tune into the exciting events that the officers have planned for the next two weeks. My name is Sarah Jones, and I'm serving as the BMSA president this year. I want to start by saying how incredibly glad I am to be back on campus and surrounded by such a great group of pre-health students. BMSA is working hard to provide you with all of the resources and opportunities you need in order to be successful in your undergraduate career. An important change within our organization this year is our move back to in-person activities. 
There is nothing like being in a room with all of your peers, and we are incredibly grateful for this opportunity. In order to keep all of these events in person, it is up to us as members of BMSA to encourage safe and responsible gatherings. That is why BMSA is requiring masks at all events this semester. Masks are an incredibly effective way to mitigate the spread of illness, especially COVID-19. If you do not have a mask, please raise your hand and an officer will provide you with one. Failure to comply with our masking policy will result in you not receiving points for this event. Also, I would like to thank everyone for putting away all phones, laptops, and homework to give your full attention to the guest speaker. Now, I hope you all get excited for what we have to offer this semester. I'll now hand it off to our executive board members who have been putting so much work into creating educational and engaging activities this semester. Hey everyone, like always, we have a ton of service events for you. On Monday, we have Cherry Toss Food Pantry from 2.30 to 3.30. On Tuesday, we have Pack Up Hope Packing from 5.30 to 6.30. Wednesday, we have Pack Up Hope Unpacking from 7 to 8 a.m. On Thursday, we have four events. We have Jubilee Market, Living Springs Volunteering, Urban Re Reaps, and Talitha Coombe. Friday, we have Habitats for Humanity for, from 3 to 5. And then Sunday, we finally have Community Health care of Texas card making from 1.30 to 3.30. Check them out on the Google sign up form. See you there. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie. I'm the research and internship chair. So this week, uh, starting tomorrow, we actually have a really cool workshop. It's called COVID-19 Vaccines Research and More. So um, that one's going to talk pretty much all about how the vaccines are made, how they work, um, some of the research behind COVID, what we found out about it, and so much more. So definitely check it out. So it'll, again, it'll be tomorrow at 7, but you'll also have another chance next Wednesday on October 15th. So be on the lookout for that. And then on Thursday, we have a research etiquette um, at 7 p.m. And that one's a really great uh, workshop to go to if you want to learn a little bit about maybe how to present yourself when you're in research. And then on Friday, we have medical school spotlight. So that one is gonna be um, a chance for you to kind of learn about some of the medical schools in Texas, as well as maybe some out of state schools. That'll be at six, so not seven, at six. And then on Monday, um, October 11th, we have an EMT scribe and CNA workshop. So come to that if you wanna learn a little bit about maybe becoming an EMT, becoming a scribe, becoming a certified nurse assistant, things like that. Those are really great opportunities to kind of learn about. And then the following Monday, um, we also have Trauma 101. And that's a really cool workshop to go to if you want to learn a little bit about how to handle trauma, um, just in maybe everyday scenarios. So check it out. Um, be sure to sign up on the event sign up form, and we hope to see you all there. Hey, guys. My name is Danny. I am the vice president of BMSA this year. And I just want to remind you guys about one-on-one -on -one mentoring, you can sign up on the event sign-up form, as well as in the weekly email. And we also have Mentorship Social on 7.30 on Tuesdays in the BSB atrium, alternating Tuesdays from general meetings. So next Tuesday at 7.30, we'll be in the atrium with mentors and food. So I hope to see you guys there. Have a great week. Howdy guys, I hope everyone's had a fantastic week so far. Two things. It's finally October in Texas, which means half of you already have your Christmas decorations up in your apartment or dorm. So we'll have to talk about that after the meeting. Second thing is that we actually have a very special guest coming to Baylor on October 8th. He is the Assistant Director of Admissions at VCU, that's Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. He'll be speaking to us from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. in the Foster Business Building, and I highly encourage everyone to stop by and see what he has to say, okay? You'll be hearing from BMSA's uh, Instagram and they'll be talking to kind of direct you where to go, but also keep an eye on your email for any pre-health related emails that should kind of give you any updates that might occur during that time. Take care guys, thank you. Tristan and I'm your medical discussions chair. Some events that we have these coming weeks are medicinal policy on October 7th from 5 to 6. There you learn the importance of law and medicine and how they are bridged together. We also have medical newsletter hour on October 8th from 7 to 8 where you learn to facilitate intelligent conversations on research, medical school statistics, and much more. We also have medical debates on October 11th from 6 to 7 where you break off into teams and debate a historical medical case. On Tuesday the 12th we have um, reality of mental health from six to seven where students um, learn the basics of mental health and learn why it is the new movement in medicine 
to learn about the different symptoms, psychopathologies, interventions, and certi certi certifications for mental health. And last but not least, we have medical ethics on the 19th from 6 to 7, where we discuss the importance of ethical decision-making skills for healthcare providers through scenarios of DNR of patients and health disparities. Please, if you see any of these events, feel free to sign up for them to not only expose yourself to a different aspect of medicine, but to understand moral principles that guide us in making choices as future healthcare professionals. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Sydney Young. And I'm Justin Nguyen. Um, so I'm gonna be having a clinical skills workshop on Wednesday, October 6th from 5 to 6 p.m. A pharmacy workshop with AED on Wednesday, October 6th to 6 to 7 p.m. A GHO workshop on that same day, right after, from 7 to 8 p.m. And healthcare around the world on Thursday, October 7th from 6 to 7 p.m. Also, be sure you're checking your emails regarding RTV mission trip updates. And if you have any questions about mission trips, feel free to ask either of us. Look forward to seeing you guys at our workshops. Hey everyone, Quiz is hosting a mental health workshop October 13th at 4 p.m. Uh, Signs can be found in the Google form and hope to see you there. Hey guys, it's Pardis, your fundraising chair. Crew and I are finally available on the BMSA website under the stores tab. Instructions on how to pay are posted there, so go and grab one before they sell out. And lastly, we have a profit share coming up on October 7th at Mod Pizza. So don't miss out your chance to go. Thank you. Hey guys, what's up? It's George, your social chair. There's a couple of social events coming up. On Wednesday next week, there are two social events. There's a social workshop at 4 p.m. in room C231, which counts for your academic workshop points where you can really build your social skills. And then on the same day at 6 p.m., there's small groups in room B105 where you can just chill and hang out with other BMSA members, play some board games, and do some fun activities. Then on Friday, there's medical TV show night in room E234, where you get to watch an episode of a medically related TV show, eat some popcorn, and have a short discussion. Finally, right after this meeting, there's a post-meeting social where you can socialize with each other and eat some pizza. I look forward to seeing all of you guys there. Feel free to reach out to me at any time via email or text. I'd love to be your friend and hang out with you. Good luck with any of y'all's exams, and I hope to see you guys soon. All right, guys, thank you so much for your attention. Okay, um, a few more updates after the biweekly rounds. Um, the deadline for the mission trip applications is due by this October the 7th, which is Thursday. Um, so please make sure to get those in. Um, it's a really great mission trip. This is for our domestic mission trip to the RGV. Um, that application can be found in an email that was sent to your inbox earlier this week, and we will be um, posting that application elsewhere as we get further into the week. The other update that I want to give you guys is that the VCU admissions workshop has been moved to three to 430 and foster 240. This is a really great opportunity to ask your application related um, questions. If you are pre-med, um, this is someone who works in an admissions office. So it's really, really valuable information. And I highly encourage everyone to stop by. Hi guys, my name is Danny. Um, I'm the vice president for BMSA, like I said. Today we'll be hearing from our Princeton Review rep. Um, Princeton Review is a test preparation company. How do I get down to you? Josh, Hello, are you can there? you guys see me properly? Or... Yes. Okay, okay. I'm going to share my screen real quickly. Uh, think of the presentation right here. Screen. Share broadcast. Okay, there we go. And here we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so just to start off, let me just see if I'm in here. Okay, um, so my name is John Azamoa and I'm the campus representative from the University of Houston and I will be um, kind of your liaison today and I'll be representing and uh, talking about uh, important information regarding the MCAT uh, and the first part of the presentation will just be these, um, like just general information about the MCAT and um, the importance in it in your uh, medical school uh, 
application process and then uh, how Princeton can help you uh, in that uh, crucial step that can help you get into medical school. So uh, just for some uh, information, so according to uh, a survey of, of incoming medical students, uh, over 9% of students who took the MCAT uh, more than once uh, saw an improvement in their scores uh, when they took it again. And uh, if you think about that, it's impossible to get 9% of any group of people to do anything. But yet these students all uh, presumably took uh, pre-med courses focused on applying to medical school and planned uh, when they would take the exam uh, for the uh, best measure of success. And almost university, uh, and almost university did, not, uh, uh, did not do as well as they hoped. Uh, so these students uh, who took uh, the tests a uh, second time couldn't just show up for the MCAT and do well. And they need, some, uh, they need something more. Um, and what they needed was more preparation uh, for the MCAT specifically, and not just uh, content of the MCAT, but uh, they also need the right strategies uh, for the MCAT as well. Um, so this is just gonna be a little uh, introduction, uh, giving a, a bit more uh, specific information about like what, what the MCAT is, uh, MCAT scoring, and then the print review sources or resources. So this is kind of just like a, a, a kind of a three part summary of how this presentation will go. It'll take about uh, 10 minutes. Um, so just, oh, and uh, let me know if um, I need to uh, hurry up just in case uh, your uh, journal meeting like has like another uh, part to it. Um, so below uh, is our uh, local Prince Review uh, representative. Um, so uh, if you need any information or want to talk to uh, higher up about uh, some of the things that I'm about to discuss with you, uh, that is the email she want to go to because she's going to be able to offer you, uh, she's going to be able to uh, answer any very specific questions that are beyond the scope of this presentation that you may have. Uh, but I can, I'm still more than happy to answer uh, any questions you may have uh, during this presentation. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I can like ask, or you can, you can uh, ask me any questions. Um, and I can go back to the, uh, like any slide that you need to me too. So uh, yeah, so anyways, um, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to go over the strategies that you're going to need to uh, get your, uh, you're, you're going to need uh, to get um, the MCAT score that helps you get into medical school. Uh, so, yeah, um, and the call to action uh, in this presentation is going to be uh, basically like by the end of this presentation, you're going to have the basic understanding of the MCAT and also how the score is, like, or how the MCAT is scored as well. So uh, we kind of have to answer a crucial question. Uh, I know most of you know what the MCAT is, but I, I still need to go over just uh, so we can have a like some nice consistency in the flow of information when it comes to this presentation, because um, uh, the MCAT is a very complicated uh, exam and it's a very uh, difficult one too. So it's better just to make sure you know every single facet of the exam before moving forward. So before we get into anything, the MCAT uh, uh, or the specific strategies you need to learn uh, to get a high score, uh, you have to know what the MCAT is. So once you uh, know the purpose of the MCAT, you can. Uh, know how to prepare for it. So uh, let's begin with a simple question. What does the MCAT stand for? And the simple answer is the MCAT stands for the Medical College Admissions Test, but not admissions, plural test, but a singular um, admission. Uh, that means it is the test you need to uh, take to be admitted to medical school. Um, so the medical, the medical college admissions test is key requirement to applying uh, to medical schools um, but there's uh, more to it than just that. So in fact, the MCAT is developed, overseen, and administered by the Association of American Medical Colleges. The AAMC is the governing body of medical uh, schools in America. That means the MCAT is made by medical students uh, or medical schools with the express purpose of, of, of being uh, the test taken for uh, entrance to every single medical uh, school in the US and Canada. The MCAT is also required uh, for both doctor of medicine programs and doctor of osteopathy program. So if you uh, want to be any kind of doctor, uh, the MCAT is required. Um, let's see. Uh, next part. So the MCAT is uh, not offered uh, comes constantly throughout the year. So you can't just like sign up for tomorrow and just take it. Like uh, there's a specific dates. Um, but for the spring, uh, but it's, uh, it spans from spring through uh, early fall. And you need to know that you need to know the test dates that work uh, for you based on whether you you've taken the right courses, how much preparation you need and when you need to, uh, and when you need to, um, and like basically when you need like the scores for your application, because uh, uh, there's like times when that, you know, your applications, for, like the applications for medical schools uh, open up and like there's deadlines for that as well. Um, so yeah, you need to know, uh, you need to know well, you need to know it well in advance and 
you need to know this well in advance because you may need to reschedule. And there's kind of a golden zone that the AMC um, has where it's basically you you need to be, you, if you want to get a refund or reschedule exam, it has to be a month uh, before your uh, actual uh, exam, if that makes sense. Uh, but they do understand that many students will be taking the test multiple times to improve their score. Uh, so they still don't want uh, you taking the tests as uh, often as, so they, but they like, they don't want you taking the test like as often as possible. Uh, something that a lot of people don't know is there's actually a lifetime limit for how many times you can take the MCAT which is kind of scary, but once you're taking it once, you kind of realize that like there's, it's very difficult to take it multiple times. So it's a, it's like, it's like one of, it's a, it's a very uh, taxing life event. And so it's not something you, you want to do multiple times. Uh, so the AMC is designed the MCAT to be taken uh, in the spring of the, uh, of a student's junior year or summer before, uh, the se uh, before their senior year. So even if you take uh, a year or two uh, between college and med school, the best time to take the test is still in college, uh, right as you um, have all your prerequisite courses uh, completed, uh, but they, and like, they're still fresh. But uh, on a side note, like the best time to take the MCAT is when you're ready and you're ready when you're ready. You're ready like once you've done all the preparation that you personally can, and it's never too late to take the MCAT. So uh, don't rush it. Like, like uh they, like it's it's recommended that you do it like just like make it like you know have a smooth transition by doing it at the end of the uh, your junior year or like senior year like once you finish all your prep course but honestly you just need to do it like when you are ready and when you're ready uh just depends on you and you know becoming a doctor is a very uh time consuming and it's a huge sacrifice on your end so don't feel pressured or don't feel rushed to sacrifice a large part of like your life and your sanity uh, for um, uh, like for medical school, like make sure that you're mentally well and you can uh, do it on your own time when you're ready. Um, so, oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to go back. Yeah, so on the AMC uh, says you need to take uh, your biology, physics, uh, general chemistry and organic chemistry, plus a semester of biochemistry, psychology and sociology, which is about uh, seven separate books of MCAT prep. Uh, so that's almost essentially what you would learn for in an entire year of college. So that's basically MCAT, an entire year, an entire year of college uh, uh, education. So this means that you need to know quite a lot of, uh, about the, you need to know quite a lot about the things I just said um, on the MCAT, but you also need to know, uh, you, need to, you also need to know, like you also need to know how to apply that information uh, because the way the, the way the MCAT asks questions is not normal compared to your other exams. Like if you've seen any sample questions unfortunately we don't have any sample questions in this presentation but uh, some of the sample questions uh it's a combination of general uh questions uh in stem and psychology like it, for instance like the science uh like uh portions of the mcat they uh have passages that you have to read and understand on top of the quite on top of a question that asks you to uh, apply general uh knowledge in those uh uh, scientific fields to the passage that you just read. It's very, uh, it, it requires you to think in a different way, but if you can answer those kind of questions, you'll, you, you'll be able to, you'll be able to look at tests in a different way. It is from my, my personal experience, like you'll be like, uh, like you'll be able to take the exams in a, in a very different way. Um, so yeah, we already uh, went over hey, the uh, um, prerequisites. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, unfortunately, our guest speaker is going to start speaking in, right now um oh uh okay um um do you want me to i can go to the um let me see i think there's a discount uh section that i can go to and um the uh members can take like a photo of it oh yeah yeah here's a qr code if uh they need to take it could you go ahead and send me that in an email so we could always, uh, put it on our website and advertise it more as well, please? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. I can do that. Uh, yeah, I'll send you all the information that's on it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. All right, guys. So our guest speaker tonight is Dr. Patio. Dr. Patillo grew up in Waco and graduated from Baylor in 2002, went to med school at UTSA, did his residency in internal medicine fellowship and pulmonary slash critical care at UT Southwestern in Dallas. He's now living in Waco with a family and practices at Ascension Province. So 
Give it up for Dr. Patillo. We've got a loud voice. Is this too loud? Is that good? I'll try to keep it down. Just right here. Do y'all still do mock interviews here with the staff? So I had my mock interview and the first thing they said to me was, oh buddy, tone it down. Your voice is way too loud. We're just right here. And they all acted like they were turning down their hearing aids. So I've got a loud voice, so I apologize. Danny, thank you. Thank you guys for letting me be here tonight. I appreciate it. Um, just for the record that I didn't mind that. I, I could have waited here all night. So uh, the, the MCAT was fun to, to chat about. Um, good news and bad news about the MCAT. The good news, it's the hardest test you'll ever take. The bad news, it's the hardest test you'll ever take. So uh, good luck. Um, all right, so what I've kind of done, kind of an overview of what we'll kind of talk about. I want this to be light. I want this, you can interrupt me. You can ask questions. I don't want to bore you to death. So if I am, you know, someone give me a gesture, like, come on, this is, this is crazy. Uh, I'm going to give you some cases. Danny said you guys kind of like to have some cases. I've got some off the wall pulmonary cases that hopefully you've never heard about before. I'm going to kind of go through a little bit about my experience from Baylor through medical school and residency and a little bit about COVID. Danny asked that I talk a little bit about COVID. I'm not going to preach at anybody or get political, so don't worry. Um, and then we'll open up for questions. And uh, yeah, glad you guys had me. All right. The last 20 years, I sat where you guys sat a little more than 20 years ago. I know I don't look old, so that's good. All right. So here's the case. Uh, this lady is Miss S. She's 56, she has no medical history. She's having some kind of vague chest discomfort. So she goes to the ED for evaluation. She doesn't smoke. She doesn't really have any respiratory symptoms, no history of lung diseases. She's got hypertension and uterine fibroids. Everybody know what uterine fibroids are? I didn't when I was your, in y'all's spot. All right, uterine fibroids are a benign gross on the uterus that women get. They're not cancerous. They bleed a lot. They can be uncomfortable. Uh, and they can cause issues. So she has a history of, of fibroids, which required a hysterectomy. So they had to go in about eight years ago, take out the uterus and the ovaries. Bleeding stopped, everything was good. When she got there, her vital signs were normal. Exam was normal. She's a little anemic. 11 and 33 is her hemoglobin and her hematocrit. And her chest x-ray, she's got these lung nodules. So she gets a CAT scan done. And those bigger spots, do you have a pointer, Danny? Like a red laser so you guys see the the spots there in the lung that big old spot is the heart so not that one uh which one is it here top one all right so right here she's got these these little spots are blood vessels these bigger spots are nodules so she gets admitted they consult us and she gets a biopsy a bronchoscopy and so we do a bronchoscopy and the pathologist really happened the pathologist called me and he says matt um what's this lady's history and i kind of tell them so she had something that's very rare and i have two of these patients in my clinic in waco texas and it's a very rare disease called benign metastasizing leomyoma very uncommon it's what happens is, is when the surgeon goes in and takes out the uterus some of the smooth muscle cells from the uterus break free from the from the um uh, fibroids and they break off, they commonly go to the lungs and they create these nodules. They can be kind of slow growing. They have no malignant potential. They can be locally destructive if they grow quickly and rapidly, but most of the time they're not. Um, and they worry to death that they've got cancer and there's nothing you do about it, but it's really cool and it's really rare. And now you've seen it. Benign metastasizing leomyoma. So we see some cool stuff. That's one of them. The next, another case was Mr. W, 81 year old male, no medical history avid runner this guy's run like six or seven marathons real patient patient of mine never smoker takes a little bit of an aspirin he's had a cough for two months and most of the time it never bothers the patient but it drives their spouse crazy so his wife was like you won't stop coughing you got to help him all right so his vital signs are normal his exam is normal on his imaging these aren't the real images by the way i found these on google uh, he's got this right here, which is abnormal. This is your heart border here, right heart border, left heart border here. You have your aortic knob. This is your right lung, left lung. See that little kind of opacity here? This above it's your pulmonary artery. That's a pulmonary artery, but this is abnormal on CAT scan. Looks like that. Now, if I'd have been diligent and really looked at it more closely, I would have realized 
that doesn't look like a typical cancer. See how there's kind of this darkness in there separated by kind of this white substance. This is heart here. So this is a little fat in retrospect, not at the time that I didn't notice it, um, in this little mass here. So we're all worried. We're thinking, oh my gosh, this guy's got cancer. Uh, he gets a biopsy, which we probably would have done anyway. And he had something called lipoid pneumonia. Anybody ever heard of lipoid pneumonia? No, I hadn't either. Uh, so you have to take a good history. I might've known this had I not been so hurried that day, but he had been taking very common to take mineral oil. Patients will take mineral oil. They'll get constipated, especially your older patients. And he'd been taking a tablespoon of mineral oil every day. They silently aspirate this. All of us aspirate a little bit in our sleep. But he was silently aspirating this every night he went to sleep and it formed a fat deposit in his lung and it looked like cancer. There's nothing you do about it. You just tell him to stop taking the mineral oil. Um, we gave him steroids for a little while. His cough got better and that area kind of slowly scarred down a little bit and didn't cause him any more problems. So he's a happy camper and he doesn't have cancer. Last one, Miss P, 62-year-old female, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes. See, one thing when you get to be a doctor, you use all these, these weird, uh, that's not the right one, sorry. You use all these um, kind of lettering here, and you guys have no idea what they are, but you'll learn. This is hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. You can kind of talk in this code. One thing you'll learn. Um, shortness of breath and cough, no fevers, chills, progressive shortness of breath non-smoker, everything was pretty normal. And they have this CAT scan that's very abnormal. So this is the trachea, this is the esophagus, this is your descending aorta, heart is here. All of this kind of dark color here is normal lung. And then you've got all this crap out here, all this white kind of fluffy scarring looking stuff. So it was floridly abnormal, went through everything, couldn't find out what was going on with her. We checked for autoimmune diseases. We did a biopsy that showed organizing pneumonia, which is a inflammation of the lung that's normally caused by something external in the environment that the patient is breathing in, and it's causing inflammation and scarring in the lung. We treated her with steroids, which is what you do. We could not find out what in the world she was responding to. I talked and talked to her about everything. Um, and this was kind of during the first part of COVID. And in one of the follow-ups, she had a virtual visit. So she calls me from home. And so you get the patients in their home environment. And I heard this bird kind of chirping in the background. And I was like, what? And birds commonly cause this, this problem. And I said, you know, Miss P, what is that noise? She goes, oh, that's Johnny. That's, the, that's my parakeet. Like you have a parakeet. You never told me you had a parakeet. Oh yeah, we have a parakeet. So she reluctantly got rid of the parakeet and her disease went away. But this is called bird fancier's lung. A lot of, not a lot of people, but some people who have parakeets and other types of birds in the home can get hypersensitivity pneumonitis as a result of their birds. So if you have a bird, well, hopefully you don't get this. Um, you probably won't, but it can not be a fun deal. All right, so here's my journey. I um, was in college here for four years, four years and a summer. Um, I grew up in Waco. I didn't take the MCAT. I took the MCAT when as it, this was bad flashbacks when I was listening to that. I took the MCAT the first time around. I didn't do real hot. So some of you have taken it and didn't do well, real well. Don't be discouraged. You can take it again seven times. I didn't take it seven times. I took it twice. Um, but I didn't apply right away. I did some research in Galveston with rats. Um, that was loads of fun for a year and a half. I did med school for four years in San Antonio, residency in Dallas for three. I was a hospitalist for a year between my residency and fellowship. That's basically a general internist inside a hospital rather than a clinic. And then I did fellowship in pulmonary critical care in Dallas and I've been at Providence for the last six years. Um, I majored in psychology here. I lived at Penland. I was an SAE. Um, I would hit classes in Sid Rich. You guys do some math classes that are right here. I didn't have this nice, big, fancy building like you guys do. This is great. I had good grades until I met my wife. Has anybody here failed a class? Don't raise your hand. There you go. Okay, I got a couple, a couple of good people here. So I failed a class and got into med school. Um, it was Latin. I won't tell you the teacher's name, but I didn't study at all. I don't even think I opened the book. My wife and I had met each other, and we didn't do squat that semester. I think I made a 2-2. 
Uh, my dad almost killed me. Um, but I did well otherwise. Uh, I didn't do well in the MCAT. I was discouraged. I didn't apply to med school until after I graduated, um, but I'm glad that I did. I moved to Galveston, was newly married, learned how to be a husband, still not great at that. I got in good shape. I ran on the seawall, weighed about 140 pounds. I wore these short shorts and people laughed at me constantly. Um, it was great, I loved it. I ate a lot of rice. My wife loved to make rice. That's about all we ate for the first year. Um, and I didn't like rats. I worked in the rat lab and I was one of the only ones in the lab who had actually sacrificed the rats. We had to kill the rats after we did whatever we did with them. And we had this old school guillotine that sat in the sink and you'd grab the rats, you had on a metal glove on and they'd ah, 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 be squeaking. And so you'd, you'd put the, the head in there and you'd really get it and you'd, it was awful. And no one would do it. So I had to do it every time. And it was, it was terrible. Um, so after about a couple months of that, I was like, I can't keep doing this. This is terrible. I have to retake the MCAT and try to get into medical school. Uh, I did a little bit better. Thankfully, I got in. Um, and that was the start of a long journey. So it was really nice. I don't know how many of you guys are going to go straight into medical school or whatever, or dental school. How many of you are going to take a break? But for me, taking a break was a game changer. I don't know if I could have gone straight in. It was, it was nice to have a little bit of a break. So this, or a similar picture to this, is what they showed us the first day of anatomy class. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And the um, instructor said, by the end of the class, or the end of this semester, you're going to know every vessel up there. And I thought, I've got to get out of here. i got to quit. This is terrible. There's no way. This looks like a maze of junk. Um, I was set out and I was eating my grilled ham and cheese on the back steps of the anatomy lab, drinking a big red. I remember I was like, I'm quitting. This is terrible. Um, but I did. I learned all these. And if you go, you will too. But that was one of the first pictures. So it can be daunting, medical school, but it is more fun looking back than anything I did in college, anything I did in high school. Because you meet people, you meet friends, everybody is aimed towards the same goal. Uh, and it was just a blast. I had fun. I played flag football, softball. It was kind of just like college all over again. Everybody was just a little bit more serious. So it was, it was great. I, it's changed a lot now. I had a very traditional schedule where I started out with biochemistry and physiology. A lot of the programs now are much more integrated with, with system-based learning and patient-based learning. We had some of that, um, but it was much more of a traditional medical school at the time in San Antonio. You had to study, study, study. You had to make it a job. So you got up, you go to your job at eight. I would get up, go to my job at eight, whatever. I'd study till 5.30 or six most days and then shut it off, go home and do whatever you wanted to do. I didn't do that every day, um, but most of the days you have to kind of treat it like a job to be successful. So it's a lot of work, but the difference between, in my opinion, medical school and college is I think a lot of the physics, at least for me, physics, organic chemistry, all the stuff you guys are taking now, there's no professors in the room. You won't use it again. You really won't. And it's harder. The concepts for those classes are harder than anything you'll learn in medical school. The way, reason medical school is hard is because it is a bunch of work. It is a whole bunch of work and you have to be willing to dedicate time to study all the time and truly learn your craft. You can do it. Anybody can do medical school. I truly believe that if you put the time into it. It's not nearly as complicated as a lot of the classes that you guys have been taking here at Baylor, I promise you. But it takes a lot of study and a lot of dedication on your part in order to succeed and do well. You have plenty of time to have fun, but it is, it is, can be difficult. Internship was fun. The most fun thing I'll never want to do again. I got in right at the, right about the end of my intern year, they started the hours regulations where they really kind of put restrictions on how much we could work. So we would routinely be in the hospital 35, 40 hours straight, and it was not safe. And we were, hadn't slept. And that doesn't really happen much anymore. Thankfully, that was not a good thing. Um, but that's where the true learning of how to become a doctor takes place because there's so much more to being a doctor than MCATs and um, grades, classes. It, there's so much. And at the time when I was in y'all's place, people would say, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to do well on the MCAT. 
and I'm going to make good grades and it's going to be fine. And you got to do all that. That stuff's important. But the, the way you're successful in what you do, being a doctor, being a PA, being a dentist, whatever the case may be, is truly about people and interpersonal skills and your ability to relate to each other. Um, that's truly what makes you successful in what you do. Um, I've been at Providence for six years. Uh, I do pulmonary and critical care. So I did internal medicine three years, pulmonary critical care for three years. Um, most of what I do is in the hospital now. About 75% of my time is there, about 25% or so in the office. Uh, I work in the intensive care unit with the sickest patients in the hospital. That's why I like what I do. But I like what I do also because I get to go to the clinic where people were stable and not so sick. A week in the ICU with drama and death and illness is can wear you out. So it's nice to get out of that, go to the office and have that setting as well. So I like that. There's five of us. We were there all the time. So if you like your family, don't do what I do. Um, no, I'm kidding. I love my family. But I, uh, I, we work a lot. Um, I don't probably do five nights a month on call where I'm there 28, 30 hours at a time. Uh, every other day that I'm not on call, it's an eight to five job. So it's not a bad job unless you've got to be on call. And a lot of you will choose things where you don't have to spend a lot of time up the hospital. So everything is different. What I do with pulmonary critical care is a lot more probably labor intensive than an out, you know, a surgical subspecialty or another outpatient predominant practice. And so it all varies. Not everybody works like this, but it's, it's busy. Um, I get to do a lot of procedures. I do a lot of lung cancer. I do a lot of smoking related disease, um, a lot of asthma. So a lot of just weird CT scans. Someone goes into the ER and they have some weird finding and they have to see them and explain what this little spot is in their lung. And sometimes I have no idea. And so I say, let's watch it. Let's see what it does in three months. So that's always fun. Um, so that's what I do. And then COVID came along. It's terrible. Um, COVID has been awful. Uh, it's been, I've seen more, I haven't been doing this very long. I'm 42. I've been doing, I've been on my own for six years now and I have never dealt with so much death and um, just sickness in my whole life, including training everywhere. And that's right here in Waco. I mean, I've, you know, we're the ones that kind of see the patients in the ICU. We put them on, I put them on the ventilator. I mean, I've put probably a hundred COVID patients on a ventilator. Um, and we're talking to the families, we're there. Uh, so it's been a, tr a true challenge for all the medical personnel, nurses, respiratory therapists, doctors. It's been a real eye opener and very different than anything we've done before. But this is kind of what COVID does to the lung. It turns it just, this, see this kind of black in here? That's normal lung. This white fuzzy stuff everywhere is all kind of scarring. And that's what COVID does. Here's a CT scan. It causes this kind of peripheral, what we call consolidative changes here around the lungs. And it just fills the air sacs with inflammation and crud and you can't breathe. Um, stay fit, obesity and COVID don't mix very well. Um, that's what we've seen. I told I wasn't gonna get political and I'm not, but just so you know, right here in Waco. I can't tell you what you see on Fox News or CNN or whatever you hear elsewhere, but what I have personally seen is that 88, I think the number is about 88.7, people in the hospital with COVID during this Delta wave have been unvaccinated. And about 95% of the people that I see in the ICU are unvaccinated people. So we've had vaccinated people get sick. We've had vaccinated people die. I've, I've, personally seen all of that, um, but the vast majority are vaccinated. So I recommend a vaccine. We treat with remdesivir. You may have heard of that. You may not have steroids, vitamin D, zinc. It's unclear if that really does a whole bunch, but we do it. Um, there's antibody infusions called Regeneron that we give. We give a lot of that through Ascension, probably 20 to 25 infusions a day. Uh, and I think that's really helped us out a lot during this. There's no role for plasma anymore. People were giving plasma at one time. We don't do that. There was an increased risk of blood clots, deep venous thrombosis in the legs and pulmonary embolism. So we don't do that any longer. Hydroxychloroquine never really panned out much. 
and then ivermectin is still kind of undergoing some randomized trials. You guys have already probably heard about that in the news. Um, no benefit has seen, been seen thus, thus far. There has been no great randomized controlled trial yet. They are going on right now. There's been a meta-analysis, a meta-analysis where they combine a bunch of smaller trials and they kind of amass them together. So there's a meta-analysis of about 14 trials with about 1,600 people that did not show a benefit. And the endpoints were mortality and hospital stay in those studies. So maybe we'll see something. I don't know. We don't give it in the hospital. There are people out there giving it. I don't think it's necessarily wrong. I don't think it'll hurt you if you take if you don't take whopping doses, but it hasn't panned out yet to really show any benefit. The best thing you could do is stay fit, get vaccinated. And the good news is, thankfully, it's not a real deadly disease, but it, for the, some of those people, it will be. So um, it's been, it, hadn't been, it hadn't been a lot of fun. So how to be successful. I try to think about this is how to be successful. You notice there's nothing up here about the grades, you guys are all gonna have good grades. You're all gonna have good scores if you get in and do all that. But how do you be successful once you get there? So you have to come early, 4 a.m. in our surgery rotation, it's pretty miserable, um, but it's fun when you get there. Being that getting there early is, is not fun. So my first daughter was born the day before I started my surgery rotation. And so I got two days off and then I had to start being there at 4 a.m. So you have to come early, be willing to stay late, be willing to stay late. You have to act interested. I mean, it's just so, you go, you'll go so far if you just act interested. You could not be paying attention at all in the back of your mind. Just let your professor or let your person you're working with think you're interested. It goes a long, long way. Work hard and ask questions. You're not expected to know everything. I don't know everything either. I ask questions. You have to ask questions. Be respectful, try to, no names, I'm terrible with names, but it goes a long way if you just know someone's name. Janitors, cafeteria workers, not just other doctors, nurses, RTs. Um, don't take yourself too seriously, laugh at yourself. You know, you're not gonna be perfect, you're gonna mess up, you're gonna make mistakes. If you go to, if you do this and you get through doctrine, you're gonna have a situation where you make a mistake that hurts somebody. I have, everybody has, it's happened a couple of times and it stinks, but it's a profession where mistakes, unfortunately, and wrong decisions sometimes cost people their health and sometimes even their lives. So it happens. Don't take yourself too seriously. Don't beat yourself up. Um, that's, that's just the nature of the beast with what this job is. And be kind, just be kind to each other. Be kind to the nurses, be kind to the hospital staff. Um, don't have an ego, or if you, if you do have one, try to reel it in a little bit. Um, but that's about all I have. I wanted to keep this light. I wanted to keep it kind of short so you guys can ask questions. You can ask me anything. I'll answer it as honestly as I can. Um, so with that, anybody have any questions? We got one. Yes, sir. That's a good question. I don't really know. Um, people ask me that. Um, so where I trained in, at Southwestern, a lot of our attendings, you know, a lot of people we learn from, a lot of the really good ones and fun ones were pulmonary critical care people. Um, and I thought it was kind of one of the better well-rounded educations. That's why I picked internal medicine. I thought of all the surgery, all the subspecialties I could go into, internal medicine was the best rounded education I could get. When I thought of a doctor, I kind of thought of a internal medicine doctor. You know, some people, when they think of a doctor, they think of a surgeon or they think of a pediatrician. So that's just kind of what I envisioned a doctor being in pulmonary critical care was kind of the same thing where I felt like it was the best kind of education I could get from that point forward. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, good question. Uh, I almost didn't. I really love Dallas. I almost stayed and took a job in Plano. A job popped up here at Providence. Um, my parents are still here. My brother and sister are here and I have four kids. So I had three at the time. So we wanted to be close to family. My wife was from Austin. And so it just made sense to, and we kind of always thought, we both went to Baylor. I met my wife at Baylor. 
and we liked Waco and still had a bunch of friends here. And so it just kind of made sense to come back and, and live here. And it's been good. I'm glad that I did. I miss the big city sometimes, but being back in Waco is pretty fun. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about your work? Sure. So it fluctuates. I'll put a picture of my kids up there. There we are. Uh, it's kind of blurry. Um, so this is, yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, that was a good segue. So this is James. He's eight. Laura is 42. Uh, Emma is 12, Annie's 14, Olivia's five, and that's me, I'm 42. Um, Work-life balance, it can be challenging. Um, most of the time it's, I'm, you know, I take the kids to school in the mornings. Um, we leave at about 7.20, so I take the two littles to school, so that's fun. I go to work. If I'm not on call, I'm home by 5.30, 5.45. Um, and hang out with them. The times I'm on call can be real busy. I'm gone for normally 28 to 30 hours at a time. During, so it's doable, but when I'm on call, it's tough. Going from, I had my first kid, third year of medical school, and then, so we had three in kind of a medical school residency time, and then we had Olivia, the last one, when we got here. Um, and it's hard in training, because you'll have, training, it's a lot like college, you have periods of time in college, right, where you're real busy, you've got exams, you don't have time for anything else but studying. Same thing is true with residency and, and med school. You have periods of time where you can't spend a lot of time with your family because you're busy, and then you'll have other periods of time where you can. So uh, it can definitely be a challenge. You kind of have to make your family a little bit your hobby too. When I say that, you know, you busy at work and I like to play golf, I like to be outside, but if I were to do that all the time and never go home with the family, then it's you know, I, I, that wouldn't fly very well. So you kind of have to make your family a priority and your hobby too. Um, that way you can spend time with them. Yes. Ah, oh, I like it because I can do both. Um, the hospital is easier than the clinic, in my opinion. You have everything at your fingertips in the hospital. Um, I'm inherently a little lazy. So in the hospital, you've got the nurses you can call, you can ask the PCTs like Sydney to do something, you know, and you can kind of sit back and type. And in the clinic, it's just kind of you. And so you've got to do a lot more of the legwork yourself. In the hospital, everything's at your fingertips. So you want a lab, you can get it. You want a CT scan, you can get it. You want an MRI, you can get it. If you're in the, in the clinic, you kind of have to wait on some of that stuff more often. Um, in the clinic, you're on their time. So the patient makes an appointment for 2.20. If I'm late, you know, they're sitting there, well, what are you, I'm waiting on you. You know, I get that all the time. Um, and they normally bring all their family to look at their CAT scan. And so you have to be on all the time in clinic and act like they're the most important thing during that 10, 15 minute period of time. In the hospital, they're kind of on your time. You can get to the room when you want to. Uh, most of the time, there's not the whole family there. So um, I, like, I like being able to do both. Yes, ma'am. It's the only place I got in. <laughs> so, I, so I interviewed, so they do it a little differently now, I think. So when I did it, I interviewed at the Texas school. So I got interviews at San Antonio, um, Galveston, and Tech. And so the way we did it is we prepped, it was kind of like rush. You know, we prepped them, they prepped us, and then we had a night where at midnight on the computer, they would post where you got in. So you literally got on at midnight to see if you got in or you didn't get in. So talk about like really nerve wracking. Um, I don't know what they do. Do they have rolling admissions now for you guys? Okay. So do you prep schools and then they prep y'all too? Is that how they do it? Still a match, only in Texas. So I only did Texas. That's, that's the only thing I did. Um, and I was, I said I was inherently lazy. I didn't want to fill out more applications. So, so I just did those three. So um, San Antonio was great. I loved it. Great school, great city. Um, and go someplace where it's fun too. You're going to find that wherever you guys go, a lot of your time is going to be spent in school studying, but you're going to have time to get out and see the city and, and do fun things too. So you ought to go someplace that you enjoy for a while as well and kind of get to see the culture someplace, someplace else. And uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of what I did. Of course, I didn't get too adventuresome, right? I kind of stayed on I-35 the whole time. In San Antonio, Dallas, back here. I wanted to go to Washington. I wanted to do University of Seattle for a residency. 
And my wife just didn't, didn't want to do it, but she's like, okay, if you want to do it, we'll do it. So I had it prepped number one, because the residency is the same thing. It's got a match system. And so I prepped it number one, and then we got up to about a week before we had to have our final you know, matches in and it, they started dropping down. All the out-of-state places started going down and all the in-state places started going up. So by the end, I had UT Southwest, which is where I went, North Carolina, Colorado. I don't know, we interviewed all over for residency. Um, so all the Texas schools kind of crept up at the end. So I'm a homebody, what can I say? What else, anybody else? Yes. Oh, I did Princeton Review. Um, it didn't help a whole lot the first time. <laughs> um, I did Princeton Review kind of the second time. I didn't go to all the classes. I just, you know, did, had the study books or whatever. Um, I'm very much, a, a, I kind of have to read it to get it. So actually in med school, I didn't go to class much. Uh, I sat in the library and studied. We get, so we got syllabi in med school and every med school does it differently. So every class would get this syllabus, this book like this. It'd be just Xerox sheets of whatever the professor wanted us to know. And you basically just memorize the syllabus. So I would sit all day, in the, not all day, but most of the day in the, in the library, just trying to memorize that syllabus. I'd go to some classes, but I, did, I can't learn very well by someone talking to me. So I have to be reading it myself and highlight it and mark it all up. So that's kind of what I did for the MCAT. Um, and I'm telling you, the MCAT was hard. The MCAT uh, conceptually is, was a lot more difficult to me than, I mean, I've probably taken 250 tests, I don't know, 300 tests, um, you know, board exams, USMLEs, and the MCAT was, was a booger. So you guys are getting the worst over with soon. That's great. See, that's the good news and the bad news. What else? Anybody else? Anybody want to go take call for me? I've got to go be on call at the hospital. Anybody want to do it? I'll pay you. All you got to do is answer the phone. You'll do it? Okay, good. Good. hundred bucks right there. Do you have a question? You just want to do the call. You want the money, don't you? I got you. Anybody else? Thank you guys so much. Thanks for letting me come talk to y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Tio. Will you be up in the lab with the question? Yeah, sure, sure. He's gonna stay for a few minutes afterwards. So if you have any more questions, wanna introduce yourself, whatever, he'll be right here. Um, and so if the Princeton View doesn't work for you, like Dr. Pio said, we also have Kaplan benefits. So if you scan this QR code, um, it'll help BMSA get another scholarship that you guys can apply for and get that much worth of test prep for free, which is awesome. And also once you sign up, you'll get a free um, study guide on MCAT or GRE or GMAT, whatever you wanna sign up for. So go ahead and scan that. This will also be sent out in the next weekly, e weekly email as well as on the website. So I'll give you guys a few more seconds and then hand it off to Sarah. All right, thank you guys so much for your continued attention. Before we flip over to the attendance QR code, I just wanna make a reminder that you had to have been here within the first 10 minutes of the meeting starting in order to get attendance for this. We have officers all around the room so they know who came in after that 10 minute mark. So we ask you to be honest in that. Um, once you scan the QR code and fill out the associated Google form, then you are free to go. Um, Dr. Patil will be up here if you have any questions and we have our post-meeting social. So if you're hungry, go get a slice of pizza and get five more points, um, meet some people in BMSA. It's a really great opportunity. If you go to the post-meeting social and grab pizza and leave, that is not okay. If you grab pizza, you stay for the hour, get the points. Thank you so much. Sign in. Love to see you guys. I'll see you at the post-meeting social. Y'all have a good week, guys. And all of the officers will be up here too if you wanna ask about any of our events that you heard mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. <laughs>